Okay, once again, I got some very interesting answers. The first question was about models. First order logic models and probabilistic models. And I was asking about common points and differences. Uh, I, there is not enough time to detail all the answers I, I got. Uh, some of them are very interesting. Uh, in some of them, I see some confusion. Um, some are cheating, like uh, Makur says common points both can be applied to NLP. Okay, this is a common point, but it's really not the main common point. Uh, you all seem to confuse probabilistic models with the concept of probability. Of course, you need the concept of probability to define a probabilistic model, but uh, a probabilistic model is a distribution we choose, and now I'm referring uh, most of all to parametric probabilistic models. It's a distribution we choose to model a situation. So there is a choice of the uh, developer. There is simplification. And we hope when we choose this model that we will get close to the situation in the real world or in, in the world we are interested in. And in logic, it's a bit similar. We choose an interpretation and uh, this interpretation allows us to describe a situation and for in some cases to say whether some properties are true or false. But as some of you have said, the most important is not the fact uh, of having the notion of truth and false. The most important is that uh, you can uh, describe things in all detail. Uh, for example, no, no, no. Uh, Mathieu says, les systèmes logiques peuvent traiter de représentations beaucoup plus riches. And uh, much richer representations, uh, Jenny. Some of you say that um, probabilistic models here, uh, Vanessa says, uh, le modèle probabiliste donne une approche numérique. Uh, well, that's not always true. Uh, I have placed on Moodle a book that deals with uh, what we call probabilistic graphical models. And these are graphs. They rely on the notion of probability, but they also rely on the notion of inference, and it's exactly the same notion of inference as in first order logic. So you can use inference both in logic and also uh, in uh, probabilistic models. So actually the two theories, the two approaches are not completely disjoint and uh, you can uh, even combine them. Uh, Mathieu says, is opère principalement au niveau propositionnel. Uh, here, this is uh, an understatement. So first order logic goes well beyond the propositional level. When we define uh, predicates and functions, then we have much more representative power than just with propositions. Uh, of course, if you go to Google and uh, ask uh, for the term uh, model, what you get 
is uh, this. So this is also a model. It's even the, the website is called models.com. And this is also a simplification of reality. So here we take some aspects of a human being. We simplify them. We standardize them and we call it a model. So it's, it's exactly the same idea of simplification. We keep some things in which we are interested and study them. We make the hypothesis that the other uh, part of, uh, of the world is not interesting or cannot be handled. From this simplified version, we get some conclusions and we apply these to the original, to the complex uh, thing. Okay, so uh, please do not confuse probability theory in general and probabilistic models, which are uh, a specific case of distributions which we choose to model uh, situation. And then uh, Nathan speaks of causality. Uh, and you will see if you uh, take a look at this book I put on Moodle, there is a whole chapter on causality. And um, uh, causality is important, but correlation is the most common phenomenon. So in, in the real world, we don't have clear causality. And the thing we can study is correlation. And causality is often just a, an hypothesis. Okay, sorry for not uh, going more into detail of your answers, but we are running out of time. The second question was about uh, neural networks and um, can we can you imagine of some way to gain gain insight about what happens inside a neural network? And uh, I got this is a much more concrete and practical question. I got uh, many interesting answers. Uh, uh, about convolutional networks, uh, images where you can um, see uh, parts of the image which concentrate more activity. And I got some very clear ideas about the strategies like Mathieu says, um, uh, we can uh, look at activation and we can look at weights. Now the idea, uh, for asking this question was uh, to uh, introduce you to the concept of explainable artificial intelligence. And uh, Mohammed has uh, figured that out and is giving this uh, Wikipedia link, which I'm also including on Moodle. So explainable in artificial intelligence is uh, a new domain that is um, getting more and more um, popular. And uh, I ask in my question, to whom such a tool would be uh, would be useful. And you mentioned some of you mentioned data scientists. Okay, okay, of course, data scientists are dealing with data. So they need um, to have a clear understanding of what has happened. But uh, another example, a very important example, is uh, the one of legal issues. So, for example, in medicine, uh, you know that um, doctors have uh, very heavy insurances because when they do mistakes or when they are suspected of having done a mistake, they can be uh, sued by clients or relatives of clients, and they can uh, can very can have very heavy prejudices, either financial one or lose their license, and so on. Now, when a doctor in medicine is relying on a neural network to do either a diagnostic or to choose the best possible cure for some disease. Uh, then 
if something goes wrong, this uh, doctor has to justify his or her choices. And saying the neural network advised me to do so is not justification. Using this argument, you have lost your case in court. So explain about artificial intelligence would be able to explain the choices of the neural network and the doctor would be able to say i've chosen this i've taken this decision for those reasons whether these reasons were available to him or her at the moment of the decision or later so uh Explain on artificial intelligence is about explaining, justifying, and um, justifying in front of adversity, in front of uh, legal action, in front of uh, uh, polit politicians, and so on. So it's, it goes well beyond just optimizing neural networks or uh, finding new architectures and so on. It, it's really about justification, argumentation. Okay, so thank you very much for these answers. Uh, I got once again only 15 answers while you are uh, almost uh, 30. I hope that my next questions will attract more people and let us start today's lecture because we have a very important issue today, which is semantics. Okay, uh, in uh, previous lectures and uh, threads or in, uh, or in the thread of linguistics, we saw the lower levels of study, phonemics, graphemics, morphology, syntax. Today, we will deal with the uh, two or three higher levels, which are semantics, discourse, and pragmatics. Semantics, from uh, the Greek word uh, simion, sign, is uh, the study of meaning. Uh, because it's a very vast domain, there have been sub-disciplines, so the meaning of what, and in linguistics we can take just words or morphemes or terms and study their meaning. This is called lexical semantics. We can take complete sentences as units. These are sentence semantics, or we can take complete texts, paragraphs and uh, larger texts. And this is called discourse analysis. So in all cases, we deal with meaning, but we have a different um, threshold, a different grain. Now, let us start with the simple case, which is lexical semantics. So you all know about relations between words. And uh, whenever I say word, I must insist on the fact that in linguistics, uh, there is no such thing as a word. It doesn't have uh, a very precise meaning. So it, it's better to speak about morphemes in this case, lexical morphemes, but we will still use the, the term word to, to keep it simple. So you all know about relations like synonymy, uh, but also homonymy, same sound, same written surface, but different meanings. Uh, very important are also 
the cases of hyponymy and hyperonymy. So hyponymy is a special case. So an apple is a hyponym of a fruit because it's a special case. And hyperonymy is the inverse. It's the more general case. Uh, you have a synonymy when you have hyponymy and hyperonymy at the same time, drink and beverage. But of course, there is, uh, speaking of synonyms is simplifying, is modeling. So there is no real, there are no real synonyms in, uh, in the real world because words always have connotations be the stylistic or historical or simply uh, the way they are used, sociolinguistics. Then you have also meronymy and holonymy. So meronymy is the being part of, a finger is a meronym of a hand, a hand is a meronym of a body, and holonymy is the inverse and so on. This is very nice, but uh, we would like to be a bit more systematic. Now here's one approach, which uh, is very square, very systematic, very uh, clean. It is called formal concept analysis. And the idea is that you take words like acheter, vendre, prêter, emprunter, louer, and you search for features, characteristics of the meanings of these words. And these characteristics can be, for example, binary. So if I take these six verbs, what they have in common, but what also distinguishes them is, well, they all have in common that we have an exchange but sometimes we give so when we loan or rent or sell then we give and when we buy or borrow then we take in some cases it's for money in some cases it's permanent so buying is permanent renting is temporary if you look at this table you will see that with these features, you manage to distinguish these terms. So you don't need additional features to distinguish them. These suffice to distinguish the terms. You also see that in French, there are at least two cases where you have the same word, loué. While in German, you have different terms for each case, vermieten, it's louer à quelqu'un. Mieten is louer de quelqu'un. So louer, vermieten, you are the owner. And louer, mieten, you are the locataire. Loueur, locataire. And the difference is here. In one case, you give. In the other case, you take. So meanings are not necessarily in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the terms, but here you get this nice binarization of the characteristics of these meanings. Now, this theory takes this idea of features and says, okay, I have objects, so, concepts, uh, items, and I have features. I use G for objects, Gegenstände, and M for features, Merkmale, and uh, I define a context as a set of objects, a set of features, and a set of combinations of those two. And these pairs in I, having this pair means that G 
the object G owns attribute M. So it's a binary relation between a feature and an object. And here is another example, like the, the previous one, I have different animals and different characteristics. Those that lay eggs, that live in nightly environments, those that are dangerous, domesticated, aquatic, feline. And now here is my set of objects and here is my set of features. Now, for a subset of objects, G1, I can define G1i as the set of all features that are shared by all objects. So if G1 has objects with no common features, then G1i is empty. So this is the set of common features of G1. And in a symmetric way, if I take M1 a subset of features, then M1i is the set of objects owning these features, all of them. And again, if there is not a single object sharing all the features, then M1i is empty. So you see that by using this operation i, I go from objects to features and from features to objects. And here's the example. If I take a subset shark and lion, they are both dangerous. So G1i is dangerous. If I take features dangerous aquatic, then I get alligator and shark. Now, what is a concept in this theory? It's a pair Xn where X are objects and N are features. And this pair is such that Xi equals to N and Ni equals to X. This means that a concept is a pair of objects and of features of these objects. And these objects must be such that uh, the set of features is the set of common features of the objects, exactly. And the set of um, features, so the set of features is the set of common features of the objects, and the set of objects is the set of all objects having exactly those features. So here's an example. If I take the objects cat and lion, the common features are feline. And if I take from the feature feline or the objects having these features, I get again cat and lion. So the pair cat, lion and feline is a concept because cat and lion are the only objects that are feline and feline is the only common property of cat and lion. Okay, so a concept is an, is an X which is called extension and an N which is called intention, intention with an S because it's the opposite of the extension. Extension is the set of all instances of the concept and intention is the set of all features that characterize this concept. And when I say characterize, I mean all objects I'm interested in have these features in common and they have only these features in common. Okay, so if I take the concept of human, then the extension is all humans. And the intention is it's a, a mammal 
Uh, it's a biped and uh, it loves watching uh, serials and television. So these are characteristic features or maybe some other feature uh, which is specific to humans and uh, which is sufficient to define a human. Okay, so you see this is uh, a very abstract and very elegant way of defining what, what a concept is. And then of course we can go even further and define an object concept, an attribute concept. So this is going always one step further. And uh, this gives us a partial order between concepts, which is an order both of extension and of intention. And having this partial order, we obtain a lattice, so in French, trilly, a lattice for this order. This means that if you have a domain, a technical or scientific domain with clearly defined notions, then you can attempt to apply formal concept analysis to it and say, each concept of my domain is defined by this extension and this intention. And here are the, all the relations between concepts in my domain. So this works well for well-defined domains where uh, there's no ambiguity, where the, we know exactly what we are talking about and so on. Now, the real world is a bit more complex than that. So uh, this uh, theory, formal concept analysis, works very well for specific domains, mostly technical domains, but uh, it's harder to apply it to the real world with all its contradictions and ambiguity. Another important thing you must be aware of is the resources you can use in your tasks, be, be it uh, the chatbot you are preparing or tasks you will have later in your professional life. One of these resources, a very important one, is called WorkNet. WorkNet is a lexical database. So the idea is that you have concepts, but these concepts are not described as in a dictionary with a sentence that describes the concept. They are described by terms. And these terms are called synsets, synonym sets. So the idea is that we know that a given word can have many meanings. But if I give you many words, then you can infer the common meaning of these words. So for example, let us take the term, the word car. If you look into WordNet, you will see five entries. Each entry has a synset. These are synonyms for a given meaning. And this meaning is extracted mentally by you by thinking of the common possible meaning of these four words. So when I write car, auto, automobile, machine, motor car, then you see that the common meaning would be uh, the car we drive on the street, uh, in French, voiture, voiture personnelle. And there is also 
a small description, but this description called a GLOSE is not normative. It's just for information to make sure that you got it correctly. But then a car can also be this, a rail car, a railway car, a railroad car. So here you immediately you see that this is a wagon of a train or of a tramway. So, uh, but it's also called a car, even in French, it's a voiture. So you grasp the different meanings of the word car by looking at the common meanings of these synonyms. And of course you need at least two to be able to uh, make a distinction. What that is a um, resource that is free, so you can use it freely. And it's a resource that has been manufactured. There have been uh, linguists working on WhatNet for the last uh, 20 or even more years. So it's a golden corpus. It has been carefully manufactured. It has uh, no errors or a minimum amount of errors. There have been extensions of WhatNet to other languages with uh, more or less success. And if you um, use WhatNets for other languages, often instead of giving these things, these uh, pieces of information, the uh, other WhatNets will give the ID number of the entry in the English in the original WordNet. So it's not always very easy to, to use. WordNet can be useful not only for searching for the meaning of words, but also for calculating semantic distance. For example, uh, if I'm uh, looking for the distance between car and bus, uh, what is, is a graph. The edges of these graph are mostly hyponyms, hyperonyms. Car is a hyponym of vehicle. Bus is a hyponym of vehicle. So to go from the node car to the node bus, I only need to move up one edge and down one edge. So I have a distance of two which is much shorter than the distance between car and, for example, fuel. So uh, WhatNet is one simple way of defining a semantic relation distance between terms. WhatNet is also a good resource for disambiguation because having these terms, uh, these terms appear also in other contexts. This one will appear in the context of a railway. So for each meaning, I can find a cloud of words that appear in the neighborhood of the word when it has this specific meaning. And uh, therefore from the immediate context, I can attempt to disambiguate each word. All of these techniques have been implemented and exist. Um, another resource which can be useful is FrameNet. Uh, FrameNet has an entirely different postulate. The idea is that in the real world, we have domains of activities and situations. And these situations are called in this theory frames. So for example, um, when you live in a house or an apartment, this is the frame of uh, living in uh, an environment. Then you have a frame for eating food and so on. Then you have a frame for transportation 
a frame for some intellectual um, activity and so on. In a given frame, each term has a single meaning. So frames eliminate polysemy. And in a given frame, you can describe nouns and verbs and adjectives in a very clear way. So FrameNet defines frames. You have about 1,200 frames. Then in each frame, you have words and their relations and also examples. So I invite you to go and take a look at this uh, research. It's, it's very important and can be very useful. Now, another way of exploring meaning, and this time on the level of sentences, is to use a knowledge representation language. For example, we can use first order logic. The question is, how do we go from sentences to logic? I, I will start with uh, an example, which is not a uh, natural language, is a different kind of language. It's uh, the language of the pocket calculator. If I write this, 103 plus five times two divided by seven, this is a syntactically valid expression. And I can draw the syntax tree of this expression. And this allows me to say that it's valid syntactically. What will be the meaning of this expression? What we can call meaning is the numeric value. And this is very interesting because we will have a global meaning but also a local meaning. So each subpart will have a meaning and even each leaf of this tree will have a meaning. So if we consider here that meaning is numeric value, then every part of this tree, every node has some meaning. That's the first point. And the second point is that to obtain the global meaning, I take local meanings and combine them. And this combination is exactly what we call compositionality. So remember when we started this uh, lecture, first thing we said is that there is a principle of compositionality that says that the global meaning is calculated, is obtained from local meanings plus the way we combine them. Now, in a 1968 paper, Donald Knuth uh, gives a way of calculating this meaning in a systematic way. So I put meaning in quotes because uh, here we are just, it can be just a numeric value. It's not necessarily something very profound. And this works for context-free languages. Why only context-free language? Remember a context-free language is a language that is described by a grammar where on the left, you have only a single item. There is no context. From a single item, you go to one or more items, which can be intermediate symbols or final uh, or leaves of your tree. OK. Now, the fact that on the left, you, you have always one item means that you can go the other way around. You can say, I have this rule. This is a formal grammar rule. and I can define a function that goes the other way around. 
it takes B, C, D and gives me something uh, depending on B, C, D. So Knuth calls this one a syntax rule and the one that goes the other way around, he calls it a semantic rule. In the case of the pocket calculator, when I have, for example, the operation that a number is a digit followed by a number. Here, uh, when I write 103, I have one and zero. The rule says that I uh, have uh, the one is multiplied by 10 and the zero is added. So this, these two digits gives me, give me uh, the value of 10. And if I combine with three, I get a value of 103. So I'm always multiplying this part by 10 and adding this part. And this is exactly what is done here. Maybe I've written it the other way around. And D, here I have DN. Uh, sorry, it's ND. Okay. Uh, how do I calculate the value attached to this expression? Well, I take the value of this part, multiply it by 10, and then I take the value of this part and add it to the other one. So R star, the one that goes the other way around, of the value of N and the value of D will be 10 times the value of N plus the value of D. So you see for this syntax rule, you get this semantic rule. And this is how it works. And this allows me to start from downstairs from the leaves ask myself what is the meaning of each one of these leaves and then go up to the root of the tree and in a progressive manner obtain the value of the whole expression which is the value of the root of the tree let us do this in language and we call this Montague, Montague Formal Semantics because of a big linguist called Richard Montague. And the adjective of Montague is Montagovian. So these, this is Montagovian semantics. So let me take a, a sentence in Malagasy language, Matori i Alice which means Alice is sleeping. So I could also have used Arabic. Tanam Alice. I've chosen to use Malagasy. And these are my leaves, the words, Matori i Alice. Matori is a verb. I Alice is a noun. This verb is my verb phrase. And this is my noun phrase. And here I have the rule that a sentence can be a verb phrase followed by a noun phrase. Now, why did I choose Malagasy? For the simple reason that uh, Malagasy is a VSO language where the verb is placed first and then the subject, exactly like classical Arabic. Now, how do I obtain the meaning of the sentence, which in first order logic will be simply matori, which means sleeps, ialis. So this is the predicate, sleeps, and this is a constant, alis. How can I obtain this logical formula? out of the tree of the, of the leaves of this tree. So this is something we will do this afternoon in uh, the lab. 
this is the meaning of the whole sentence. Alice is a constant, so I just write Alice, E Alice. The E is a um, um, prefix in Malagasy for denoting a proper noun. It's a way of saying uh, uh, Alice is a name. Okay. To be able to attach some meaning to this here, I'm using lambda calculus. So for those who are not familiar with lambda calculus, it's a formalism used in uh, computer science and in math. And when you write lambda x dot fx, this expression means the function that sends an x to fx. Okay. Uh, some of you may also have seen this in Python. You have a lambda operator. The idea is that um, in mathematics, when, for example, you say cosine of x, and you write cos parenthesis x parenthesis, then there is confusion because we don't know whether you mean the function cosine or the value of the function cosine at x. Of course, when you write cosine of p, then it's clear that you mean the value because p is a constant and cosine of p is also has also a numeric value. But when x is an unknown, it is not clear whether you mean a given value of that unknown or the unknown in general. So to avoid this notational confusion, by writing lambda x fx, we clearly mean the function f. And the function f is the function that assigns to any x f of x. So I can write lambda x fx or lambda y fy or lambda some symbol f that symbol. It doesn't matter. It's always simply the function f. Okay, so this is the meaning of this uh, notation lambda. In lambda calculus, I define functions and I also define application. Application is applying a function to some value to obtain a new value. So applying lambda, fx, lambda x fx to a is obtaining f of a. How can we use this in linguistics? If I write just Matori, this is a function. And a function can be written as lambda x Matori x. So here I have a function, here I have a constant. When I go up, these are rules sending an element to an another element, verb phrase to verb, noun phrase to noun. So here meaning doesn't change because when I go back, I uh, again, I don't combine anything. I have a single element on the right, a single element of the left. But here I have the rule that says that a sentence can be a verb phrase followed by a noun phrase. To go the other way around, I need to say what happens between this function lambda x matter x and this constant Alice. And what happens? Application. So when I go up 
and I have to combine many elements to a single one, the right part of the syntactic rule, the left part of the syntactic rule, then I apply the function to the constant. And when I apply lambda x matori x to Alice, I get matori Alice, which is exactly what I want. Now, what happens if I take the English version? Alice sleeps. There's a problem because my rule says I apply what is on the left to what is on the right. So I apply Matadi to Alice. But in English, Alice and the French, Alice comes first and the verb comes second. I cannot apply a constant to a function. Okay. So what can I do? Well, I'm needing something that can be applied to a function. So I will say Alice will not be a constant because I cannot apply a, const a constant to anything. A constant is just a constant. Alice has to be something else, something that I can apply to sleeps. And sleeps is lambda x sleeps x. So sleeps is a predicate. So what can I apply to a predicate? In lambda calculus, it will be lambda predicate. How can I write Alice as a, a lambda predicate something? The solution is to write lambda p, p Alice. And this is called type raising. It's a trick. Well, it's a very useful trick. So I decide that Alice will not be a constant. It will be a lambda p, p, Alice. Now, intuitively, this means that instead of giving you Alice, I'm giving you an answer for all questions about Alice. I'm giving you a method to answer all questions. Every question on Alice is a predicate on Alice that can be true or false. And lambda p, p Alice says, give me a predicate and I will apply it to Alice and you will get the answer. Okay, so this is intuition. Now, if I do this, as you can see, here I have lambda p, p Alice. Here I have lambda x sleeps x. Now, here I'm going up, so nothing happens. And here I apply this lambda p, p Alice to lambda x sleeps x. And if you do the calculation, you would see that what you get is sleeps Alice. Now let's take a more complex case. Gerard loves Alice. How would we define loves? The most natural thing would be lambda y, lambda x loves x, y. So give me a y and give me an x and take loves x, y. And of course, we can do again type raising both for Gerard and for Alice. If I apply this lambda y, lambda x loves x, y to Alice, which is type raised, uh, it doesn't work. Um, it's not what I need. 
sorry, this here should be Gerard. This is an error here. So uh, maybe I can correct it. Uh, okay. So in this tree, which is the semantic tree, I'm missing this part. So in fact, this here should be more complex, more uh, should be different. Intuition is not always good. We need something here that can be combined with that one. And then when we have type raising with this thing, we get love, Gerard, Alice. And the answer is this one. So here is how to model a verb like loves, which is a transitive verb. It has a subject and a direct object. Here is how to model it so that calculation works. And indeed, we can check that when we apply this to that, so we apply this part to that part, we get this part. And when we apply this to that one, we get the result. So this is Montague semantics. It gives you a means of modeling each word so that when they combine, they eventually end up at the root of the tree and we get the meaning of the complete sentence. One of the epiphenomena of um, Montague formal semantics is the fact that more a word is small and frequent, the more the corresponding formula will be complex. So here's an example. If I take the sentence, the philosopher loves Alice, uh, not only have philosopher loves Alice, but the philosopher, so it's a unique philosopher, so I need here an existential quantifier plus a unicity, uniqueness uh, feature. And to obtain this formula, the definite article V has to be modeled like this. Okay, so you see this very long formula represents the definite article V, or in French, le. So is this reasonable? Uh, it's a characteristic of Montague uh, formal semantics. This theory uh, appeared in the 50s and 60s, and uh, it was uh, not very welcome by linguists because it's quite complex. It needs a lot of math. And since um, natural language has many ambiguities, uh, Montague semantics uh, didn't uh, really envision these ambiguities. So Montagovian semantics has been used mainly in artificial languages, in controlled languages, in programming languages, and less in natural language. And uh, Richard Montague was quite a personality. He had uh, many lives in, in parallel. He, he, was, um, he had a, a nightlife as a homosexual. Uh, he, he had, um, um, he was professor of linguistics and at the same time he was selling a house so he was a real estate manager he, he was also organist of um, of a church um, protestant church and of course nobody knew about uh, all of his activities besides himself and he was assassinated probably due to some of these activities, I don't know which one, 
nobody ever found who killed them. And uh, here you see uh, three novels written on him and on his life, on his theory and his death. So I advise you to read uh, the third one, which is uh, very nice. Uh, avoid the first one at all costs. It's one of the most horrible books that have ever been written. Uh, you need uh, really strong nerves to read it. But it's a unique case of a linguist having such an adventurous life and uh, becoming a novel. Uh, sorry, I have a question. Um, the third level of uh, semantics is the one of the discourse. When we say discourse, we mean more than one sentences. Also not necessarily a paragraph, but a few sentences that are related in some way. How do we represent a discourse? Once again, there are many theories, many tools. One of them is DRT, Discourse Representation Theory. So DRT uses logic and a formalism called boxes. In a box, you have two parts. On the top of the box, you have variables, which are first order logic variables. And inside the box, you have formulas, predicates, predicates or something more complex. You start with a small box for the first sentence of your discourse, and then your box becomes larger. Here's an example. If I start with the sentence, Max owns a dog. I have two variables because of the two entities of this sentence, that is Max and the dog. So I have X and Max is X and I have Y and the dog is Y. And between X and Y, I have the relation owns. So you see whatever I have, uh, all predicates have arguments that are variables, never constants. If I add the second sentence, it has bitten Amelie. When I start processing this, I don't know who or what has bitten Amelie. So as an independent sentence, I have an, again, two entities, it and Amelie. So I'm adding two variables, U and Z. Z will be Amelie. U has bitten Amelie. And now by doing an Afora resolution, I come to the conclusion that it has to be the dog. Now in English, it's obvious because it's it and not he. And in French, it's less obvious. Il a mordu Amélie, il can be Max or the dog. Both are possible. So here I'm using this equality in the sense of first order logic interpretation saying that whenever I take an interpretation of these formulas, the value I give to U and the value I give to Y must be the same. So you see that in this box, I have the information I got from both sentences that there is a dog 
and this dog is owned by Max, and this dog has bitten Amelie. But I still keep separated the variable of the second sentence, which is you, and the variable of the first sentence, which is why. Just in case I did an error and I have to go back. So you see, it's not simply the merged meaning of Max owns a dog, it has bitten a mini. It is taking over the structure of each one of these sentences, writing it down and adding relations from an Afora resolution. So it's both all the structure I get from each sentence plus the relations between the sentences. And you have tools for doing this. If you go, if you go to this address here at uh, Université de Toulouse, uh, you will see a system for discourse representation of French, and you have similar systems for English. Um, between sentences, you have sometimes what is called discourse connectors. When you are writing sentences, there is always a reason why you add many sentences in a given order. These reasons are discourse relations. And sometimes you have words that make these reasons explicit. And these are called discourse connectors. So for example, um, uh, when you say, when you start a, um, a sentence, therefore, this means the sentence is a conclusion of the previous one or the previous several sentences. If you start your, your sentence by afterwards, it means that it's a temporal sequence and you are continuing this temporal narration. Uh, if you start your sentence by, on the other hand, it means that you're uh, going in a different direction, that you are negating, you're giving a counterexample, and so on. Uh, here, this uh, reference I'm giving you is a PhD thesis, a French PhD thesis, giving about 200 different discourse relations between sentences and also discourse connectors whenever they are explicit. But in many cases, you don't have explicit discourse connectors. Like here, between Max own a dog, owns a dog and it has bitten a melee, there is no explicit discourse connector. Uh, you can say that this is starting a narration and this the continuation of this narration because there is a temporal order. First, Max owns the dog, and then the dog bites Amelie. Why are discourse relations important? For many applications. For example, one uh, very nice application of uh, discourse representation theory is summarization. This is an important task in natural language processing because sometimes you have many texts to read. You don't have the time to read them. You need a summary. So you need to summarize them. And summarizing has been an important challenge in natural language processing from the beginning. And until now, there has not been a, a a good solution to summarizing. 
when you study discourse relations, then you get a tree between sentences and the edges of these trees are discourse relations. Now, how do I know it's a tree and not a graph? This is a postulate in discourse representation theory that uh, you are not writing cyclic texts. It doesn't make sense. So when we create text, then we take care of not having cycles. And therefore, when we write down discourse relations, we get a tree. Okay. This tree is directed and it is rooted. When I take the root of this tree of discourse relations, I get the first and most important sentence of the text because all, because the others are related. And then again, I have those on the second level and so on. Taking this sentence is already a first step for the summary of the text. And then I can say, I take the root of this tree, the discursive tree of the text, and I take the first children, first level of children, two levels of children, and so on. And this gives me a summary of the text. This gives me the most important sentences of the text. And this is an application of this course uh, representation theory. Uh, you are preparing a chatbot. In a chatbot, you want to keep some things in memory. Keeping things in memory is the same thing as here, finding relations between sentences. So the relation is both the reason for which one sentence follows the other and the common pieces of information between the sentences you have to keep. So an ideal chatbot, but of course you don't have the time or the energy to do that, but the ideal chatbot would use discourse representation theory to keep a consistent uh, dialogue and a consistent text. Okay, it's time for our break. Uh, we can start again at um, 11 o'clock and we will move to another important subject, which is pragmatics. So see you at um, 11. Uh, before we move to pragmatics, just a small comment on semantics. Uh, you are, of course, interested in implementations, and uh, this afternoon you will see an implementation, simple implementation of um, Montagovian semantics, um, uh, obtaining first order logic as a representation of um, meaning of sentences, and um, uh, the next week we will see uh, another system called uh, the semantic web using ontologies and description logics, which is a simpler form of uh, logic, different than first order logic, for representing the meaning of uh, sentences, uh, text, and so on. So you will see at least two different implementations of um, semantics. Now we will move on to pragmatics and here implementation is very limited. So what you will see now ha has not yet been implemented in a standard way. Uh, we are still on an um, experimental basis and many things have uh, not been implemented at all for the moment. So pragmatics is the study of meaning 
either of words or statements in the context. When I say context, I mean that a sentence is something abstract. A sentence can be uttered and then it becomes an utterance in French, enoncé. And an utterance is a statement uttered in a given context. So either orally being produced in a conversation or in a lecture right now, or written in some uh, page or book, uh, etc. So we distinguish semantics of sentences, which are abstract objects, which are uh, uh, outside any context, and utterances, which are studied by pragmatics. Now, when you have a context, you are in a communication situation. It means that you have a sender, a receiver, and a message. And in the case of linguistic communication, the message is the meaning. But meaning can be linguistic and non-linguistic. You can have many components of meaning. And then you have also uh, the meaning that the speaker intended to transmit, and then the meaning that was perceived by the receiver. The meaning the speaker intends to perceive as it is emitted in a given context, omits some parts that are related to the context. So here is a typical example of the importance of uh, pragmatics. When I take the statement, the train leaves in 10 minutes. This is an abstract sentence with a noun group, a verb, uh, sorry, a noun phrase, a verb phrase, and so on. But the meaning I want to transmit through this sentence, through this statement, will be different depending on my geographical situation. So my temporal situation is fixed since I'm saying that the train leaves in 10 minutes. So I'm at the same temporal moment, which is the departure of the train minus 10 minutes, but if I'm just in front of the train or next to the train, then it means let us go to the dock. If we are outside the railway station, then it means let us hurry, otherwise we will miss it. And if I am at some other place on the opposite side of the town, then it means we lost it because we have no means of going to the railway station in only 10 minutes. So you see that the receiver of this message receives the sentence per se, but is also aware of the context and therefore can interpret the sentence in a way that depends on the context. This additional information added by the receiver has been studied by um, Paul Greis and he defines the notion of implicature. So implicature is information that can be deduced by inference. 
So for example, in the case of the train example, uh, if I'm giving, I'm emitting the train leaves in 10 minutes and the receiver knows that he or she is very far away from the railway station, I can take those two pieces of information and apply an inference step to obtain the meaning we missed the train. So the implicature will be we missed the train. Here is a different example. Um, Somebody is asking, are you coming to class this afternoon? And getting the reply, I have an appointment with the dentist at three. Of course, this is not a literal answer to the question. The literal answer expected would be, yes, I will, I'm, I will come. No, I will not come. But here, taking this answer, we use some background knowledge. For example, the fact that when I have an appointment as important as a dentist appointment, I have to go to that place. Then the fact that I cannot be at two places at the same time, at the dentist and in class. And third piece of background information, three o'clock is part of the afternoon. Probably the class is also at three o'clock or a bit earlier. So from all of these pieces of information, I can logically deduce that the answer that no, I will not come to the class. And this is something we are doing subconsciously. Some people are not doing this, and this is a symptom of autism. So one of the uh, symptoms of autism is not being able to do this implications. So an um, autist of this specific kind, while when hearing, I have an appointment with the dentist, will ask, uh, yes, and so what? I'm asking where you are, whether you are coming to class, not whether you have an appointment with a dentist. And the other person will have to explain. Grice has given, among other things, nine maxims, so nine advices, nine rules to be respected in conversation. And since uh, you're building a chatbot, these rules can be useful for implementing a coherent and uh, socially acceptable conversation with the chatbot. The first rule is about quantity that has to be sufficient. Make your contribution as information as informative as required. So don't omit part of the information you are asked for. But second rule, do not make it more informative than required. So don't overdo, don't give unneeded information. A third and fourth rules are about quality. Don't say something you believe to be false, unless you want to cheat, unless you want to deceive uh, in your conversation. And do not say that for which you lack adequate evidence. So don't say something you are not really sure of. Or if you do, then take precautions and say, I'm not sure, but I think that this thing happens. The fifth rule is about relevance. 
what you sh say should be relevant to the question. So when I ask you the weather tomorrow, don't reply about the um, results of the lotto. The sixth and uh, six to ninth rules are about manner. So when you reply, avoid obscurity, unless you are a guru, avoid ambiguity, be brief and be orderly. Now this sound a bit like um, savoir vivre, uh, like uh, social rules, but in fact, we use them subconsciously and we also transgress them sometimes and all this is part of uh, meaningful conversations. So let me take an example. Uh, if I say the exam consists of three parts, then according to Maxim 1, I am giving the information that the exam consists of three parts and I'm giving as much information as required. So when I say three parts, I mean three and not four. If you take first order logic, when something has four parts, then in particular, it also has three parts. Okay. So saying the exam consists of three parts is true. It's a true sentence also if the exam in fact has four parts. I'm not saying it has exactly three parts. I'm just saying it has three parts. But thanks to Maxim number one, when I say three parts, you understand that I mean exactly three parts. Another example, when I say George, George saw Marie and went to the movies. Logically, I have two sentences, George saw Marie and the sentence George went to the movies. But in fact, this and has also a temporal meaning. So he first saw Marie and then went to the movies. And this is maxim number nine, be orderly. So put an order in things you say, and this order can be temporal, can be the order of importance and so on. When somebody asked me, where is room B3144? And I reply somewhere in that direction, showing with my hand uh, a given direction. Then I transgress Maxim one because I don't give all the information needed. Just giving the direction is not sufficient to find a room. But obviously I don't know. But I do respect Maxim four. So I don't say something for which I don't have evidence. So I'm respecting, I'm giving more importance to Maxim number four than to Maxim number one. And uh, this is a negotiation between me and the uh, person who asked the question. Now we have two phenomena called metaphor and irony in which Maxim number three is voluntarily transgressed. So Maxine number three is do not say something that you know or believe to be false. We do this in two cases, in metaphor and irony. So what is metaphor? Metaphor is exploiting analogy 
exploiting the knowledge we have of a domain to understand and to reason about another domain. Uh, and metaphor has begun to be formalized. So you have resources on the net uh, with metaphors. For example, you have MetaNet, a database of 650 metaphors in frames. So this is again a way of structuring the domain of metaphors. And here's an example. If you go to this website, you will see that you have a frame, a frame of family. And metaphors like a community is a family, a company is a family, a country is a child, a market is a family, a nation is a family. So you see that these are metaphors. But when we talk about a nation, which is something very abstract, we use the metaphor of the family to explain things, to explain our opinions and beliefs and arguments about the nation. A computer will be able to make this translation from the concepts in the frame of nation to the concepts in the frame of family and back and extract the meaning from metaphors. And there has also been work on irony. So irony is um, a special metaphor where you have um, uh, when you're saying the contrary of what you mean. And there, there have been some studies and there are some tools also for detecting irony. So you see these issues are beginning to be dealt with. For the moment, we are just classifying metaphors. We are detecting metaphors, detecting irony. We are not... Uh, ready to really deal with it but uh, we are slowly advancing in this field and uh, in the next uh, 10 or 20 years you will see a lot of development in, in this field a special kind of languages are so-called controlled languages a control language is uh, a language in between formal and natural languages. The idea is that a formal grammar defines a formal language, which is something very strict. A natural language is by definition, a language that has evolved in time and uh, it carries polysemy, it carries ambiguities, it carries metaphors and irony and many, many methods for communicating meaning uh, that can be ambiguous and maybe even contradictory. Sometimes we want to deal with a given domain of knowledge or of activity and we want to use something close to natural language so that people who are not computer uh, scientists or engineers can use some language but we also want some rigor we want to avoid ambiguity we want to have a fixed vocabulary and specific syntax rules and uh, specific semantics. In that case, we use a controlled language. Here I have an example of a language called Peng. Uh, Peng for uh, 
something English, uh, practical English or something like that. I, I don't remember. And here's an example. Every animal eats all plants or eats all animals that are smaller than A and that eat some plants. While the fox sleeps, the cat chases a bird. So this looks like English. It can be understood by any speaker of English, but it's simple enough to be processed unambiguously by a syntax parser. And we can use Montagovian semantics, for example, to obtain the meaning of every sentence. And we can even do discourse representation since, um, well, you don't see it here, but even the ways of um, uh, doing co-reference are standardized. Ah, sorry, it's processable English. What is this used in? Uh, for example, a um, notorious user of controlled language is the company Black & Decker. Black & Decker writes user manuals for equipment in a controlled language. They have tools that check the uh, syntax um, validity, correctness, and the semantic uh, processability of text of user manuals. And once they have checked the manual of being syntactically and semantically uh, conformant with the controlled language, they have translators in dozens of languages. These translators have, I mean, uh, tools, of course, I mean, algorithms translating language. And these algorithms are based on the syntax and on the semantics of the controlled language. So there is no error in translation. Nobody's lost in translation. Of course, this works only for user manuals of Black & Decker equipment. And they have complete control on the language and on the translation tools. But this, uh, by this um, process, they don't have to pay human translators and they are sure that there will be no errors in the user manuals. Or if there is an error in the original, the same error will be in all the translated versions. Another case where controlled language is used is uh, in communication uh, between people uh, of different origins. So, for example, uh, between an airplane and the control tower, uh, English is used, but not broad English, not plain English, but a simplified version of English so that errors are excluded and that um, everything is controlled, under control. There has been an um, uh, important reference on controlled language by Tobias Kuhn, and he has given a grid for classifying controlled language. And he has four criteria, precision, expressiveness, naturalness and simplicity. These are four independent or more or less independent dimensions. So precision is how well can we pass the language? So first order logic is absolutely precise. A natural language is not very precise. Expressiveness is how well can we express our meanings? Here we have the opposite. Natural language is much more expressive. Naturalness is how close are we to a natural language? 
So this is really on the surface. Are we using words or symbols? Uh, are, are words, uh, do they have a morphology? Do we have uh, grammatical morphemes or not and so on? And finally, simplicity. This is a bit simplistic. It's ironic, but it's a simplistic criteria since uh, simplicity is measured by the length of the manual of the language, of the controlled language. If you can describe it in 10 lines, then it's much simpler than needing 100 pages to describe it. And pink, this language uh, with the example you saw here, is five, so very precise, three, um, average uh, expressive, uh, well natural, and average simple. And there is a conference every two years on controlled languages, and um, you also have visual controlled languages and so on. So it's a domain uh, which is uh, quite popular and uh, can be uh, important in many cases. Now let's move to another important topic, which is argumentation and opinion. When we study discourse representation, we just look at the relation, we look at the meaning of each sentence and the relation between sentences. When studying argumentation, we go one step further and we define arguments. So some sentences may carry arguments and some other sentences may contribute to these arguments, either in positive or in a negative way. And we obtain what we call argumentation. So this is important because you have uh, people who are in favor of participative democracy where people are invited to discuss, but uh, a discussion is only useful when it carries arguments and it brings conclusions. So uh, politically and socially useful discussion is a discussion with an argumentation. People provide arguments, reply to arguments by providing new arguments, and a consensus happens and one or more conclusions are obtained. And since this is an important activity, one branch of natural language processing is dealing with argumentation mining for finding arguments and this is also useful for detecting fake news because very often uh, fake news are just not just simple facts which are fake but also a complete argumentation that is based either based on false facts or makes argumentative errors to obtain false conclusions A branch of argumentation mining is rhetorics. So rhetorics are communication strategies, most of the time trying to persuade. And when you want to persuade a public about your opinion, and this was known already in the antiquity, you have three ways of doing so. You can be logical, like Spock in Star Trek. You can be ethical, and this is about credibility, authority, and uh, responsibility. And you can be 
emotional, like American movies. These are called logos, ethos, ethos in Greek, and pathos. Of course, what um, natural languages processing can do the best is logos, logical inference. But sometimes you are also interested in emotion. What is common to emotion and uh, ethos, and uh, which is not very much present in uh, logos, is subjectivity. And this is something um, you need for chatbots since chatbot is a persona. It's an entity that communicates like a human. And therefore, it has a first person, I. And therefore, at some point, your chatbot will have to be subjective or at least will be confronted to the problem of subjectivity. So what is subjectivity? It's a person's mental state, which is not transmitted directly, and the part of it that uh, is used for communication. So if we want to formalize subjectivity, one way of doing so is saying that we have three kinds of assertions. We have those that are verifiable public, verifiable private, and unverifiable. A sentence like Cruzane has more than 12,000 inhabitants is verifiable. You can go to Wikipedia or you can start counting them one by one. And sooner or later, you will have a result and you can assert whether this sentence is true or false in the real world. Then you have verifiable private. When I, if I say I drank a coffee this morning before I started the class, you have no means of verifying it. But if you were here or had a camera, or some way you could check whether this is true or false. And finally, unverifiable, for example, opinions. If I say I don't like this wine, there is absolutely no way for you to prove it or to prove the contrary. Now, this may sound a bit raw, but it's already a task in natural language processing to classify a assertion in one of the three kinds and then take the appropriate measures. Now, what is an opinion? You have heard often the term opinion mining. What is an opinion? So how do we formalize an opinion? Uh, one of the approaches and this has been initiated by you, is that opinion is a tuple. You have a target, so a, an opinion upon what? A sentiment, so what is the contents of my opinion? Who am I? And when did I have this opinion? So it's the what uh, to uh, no uh, towards what what opinion who has this opinion and when and opinion mining is instantiating this tuple in a massive way so you just you don't care just about the second part the, the sentiment. You also want to know who has this opinion and when. And who means also a classification of the agent, of the individual, what age, what profession, what gender, geographical situation, social situation, and so on. And the timestamp because opinions can change. 
a statement containing an opinion is called a point of view. And this point of view can be argumented or not. So if it's argumented, then you have the point of view, which is the conclusion. And then you have a sheaf of support arguments. So one or more arguments that are connected in some way or not. And a, another person who studied opinions, Rajendran, has given some other useful definitions like the implicit opinion. An implicit opinion is combined with an enthymeme. So here is an example. When I say the rooms of this hotel were rather small. Remember what we said about pragmatics. Here I'm giving something that looks like a fact, that is maybe a fact, but it doesn't look like an opinion because I'm not stating whether I'm happy or unhappy with this hotel. But the enthymeme is the rule saying that rooms in a hotel, in a good hotel, rooms are big, or at least uh, of a reasonable size. And the better the hotel, the bigger the rooms. This is the enthymeme. Enthymeme comes from uh, Greek. Uh, Thymame means I have memory. I uh, remember. So enthymeme, uh, whenever you have the suffix em, means it's a atomic unit, an atomic unit of memory. Uh, here it means a rule saying that how do we classify hotels with respect to the size of rooms? Well, the better the hotel, the bigger the rooms. So when I'm saying the rooms of this hotel were rather small, I'm giving an implicit opinion. Can the computer uh, pass this? Yes, uh, it's um, using this enthymeme, using some rules which can be taught to the computer. And once the computer knows that good hotels have big rooms, it can go the other way around and say, when this person says uh, rooms are small, he or she means the hotel is not good. In a different uh, approach by Austin, we have what we call speech acts. Speech acts, again, are implicit elements hidden in sentences. And these are, in fact, intentions. And when I speak about intentions, you should immediately think about chatbots, since chatbot, as we have seen, um, the first thing they do is to detect intentions. So when I say you shouldn't read that book, it's, uh, well, it's not an order, but it's an advice. When I say, what is your name? Then I'm asking, I'm emitting a query. When I say yesterday, I met a philosopher, I'm asserting something. When I say Max is the most intelligent child in the world, I'm claiming something. So the difference between assertion and claim is that here I have some part of this element which is unverifiable and therefore can be untrue while here uh, I'm intent, I intend to give the complete truth. Here I may have some part of exaggeration. I can also estimate and so on. So each of these intentions is a kind of performative speech act. 
Now, there have been many approaches to speech acts. Here you have five different kinds. Assertive, directive, expressive, declarative, and commissive. So assertive is simply an assertion. Directive is asking for something. Expressive is expression and emotional state, which is different than asserting. Even though sometimes the frontier, the frontier may not be very clear. Declarative is changing the state of the world. So again, this is uh, the, the frontier is not very clear. And commissive is committing uh, oneself. Austin, the same Austin as here, has a different classification of speech acts in three parts, locutionary, elocutionary, perlocutionary. Locutionary is producing utterances, sentences in a given context. Elocutionary is the intention between, behind the sentences you produce. And perlocutionary is the effect that they have on the receiver. So this is not really a classification of the speak act, speech acts per se, but is three domain of studies. The first one is what are you producing? The second one is why do you produce it from your point of view? And the third one is what effect does your production have to your uh, interlocutor? And this brings me to well, almost the last slide, which is the functions of language. So according to Jacobson, yet another linguist, language has six functions, six possible functions. And again, you can do the connection with your chatbot. Uh, it would be nice if a chatbot can distinguish between these functions because the answer of the chatbot, the reaction of the chatbot will be different depending on the function. First function is referential. When I am describing the world in general. Se second function is expressive. I am describing my mental and emotional state. So the first one is objective, the second one is subjective. Third function is conative. Conative is using language to change the behavior of the receiver. So addressing a request, an order, an, um, an advice. So be silent. It usually ends with an exclamation mark. Metalinguistic, and this is an interesting function, is when language is about language. So here you see the word, word is a noun. I'm speaking about not words in general, but this specific word. So when I write this, it's not the meaning behind the word that interests me, it's the word per se. And uh, for example, if you ask a chatbot, how do I spell um, accueil? The chatbot must detect the metalinguistic function uh, of your language. And of course, the verb spelling carries these metalinguistic um, functions. So, there is no ambiguity when I ask somebody, how do you spell this word? I mean the word and not what's the referent of the word. But sometimes we can play with words and do a voluntary mix between the word and its meaning. So switch from metalinguistic to referential. 
we have also have the FATIC function. FATIC function is trying to establish contact. And we also have the poetic function, which is using language both as words, as language, as um, in a metalinguistic level and for the meaning. So the poetic is a mixture of metalinguistic and uh, expressive or referential. So these are not mutually contradictory or exclusive. Sometimes you have more than one functions at the same time, but these are supposed to be complete and to explain other possible uses of uh, language. And then uh, there is a novel called the seventh function of language, which uh, of course uh, imagines some other function and it's a very interesting novel uh, describing a period of um, French um, intelligentsia uh, structuralism and uh, post-structuralism and so on. So I advise you to, to read. So it's time to uh, stop. We have finished the complete uh, class on linguistics. Uh, these slides can serve as a reference for you it's important to have um, a global uh, knowledge of uh, fields so that um, once you face a problem you can go back and uh, find the references and uh, find the, the uh, appropriate tools there has been uh, many tools developed in the last um, 10 20 years and uh, you cannot possibly have a complete list of them. So when you face a problem, you need some understanding of your problem to uh, start searching for tools. And then again, some understanding of the problem to be able to evaluate this tool, these tools and make them work together. Okay, so... Uh...